Welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is my weekly, at least usually weekly, broadcast. I did not have a show last week uh, due to some a uh, little bit of a snafu on my end, uh, but I normally uh, do this every week, and this you are listening to is my vlog, my weekly show, my weekly record of the time, and al- an alternative to the RIA, the MPAA, the IFPI, Spotify, Netflix, and Gormley, uh, as well as various other commercial entities. And so if you are listening to this on Spotify, and if you have somehow managed to tune in to this on Spotify, please unsubscribe from Spotify and cancel and delete your account. Stop giving Spotify your money. So what is going on in the world of Jeff and the world around me right now? Well, uh, the first thing I want to get to is I just want to point out, as you may have noticed, if this is not the first time you've tuned in, a lot of the time I do have guests. And this week, I, it's no exception, I did try to get some guests involved. And in particular this week, I noticed uh, pretty much everyone, or a lot of the people I invited, were on the right side of the political spectrum. And so let it be known that I did try to get their voices heard too. The Yellow Jackets here in Saskatchewan, I think one of them. There was definitely people who had the option of having at least some kind of a dialogue or an argument to get their point across, but they have all decided not to tune in. So sucks to be them. This show does have a little bit of a leftist bent to it, and that's too bad for them that they didn't get to kind of correct that if they saw fit to, but we're going to move on from there. So uh, what's the first thing I want to point out today? Today, a couple episodes ago, I think it was actually one of the ones banned from YouTube, so uh, my attempt at relaxing background music, but I did have one particular song that I had found in a list of, it was, quote, Mix Remix Radio, a Creative Commons remix uh, from May 1st, 2019, from mixremix.cc. And the particular song I chose was a song called Band in America by one Ginger Tom. Now, here was me not reading a little bit of the fine print on this one, but it was from Jamendo. It was, in fact, a Creative Commons song, but it was unfortunately not by NCSA Creative Commons. So there is a little bit of variation in Creative Commons licenses. And this one in particular was a CCBYND, meaning I could share it, I could have it for free from the Internet Archive, where I personally got it from. Uh, but I wasn't supposed to add to it. Now, I didn't really add to it. It was still whole in its entirety. So I think I abided by the letter of the <laughs> license, at least. But unfortunately, YouTube kind of snagged me on it. And any attempt to appeal this is not going anywhere. So that particular video is off of YouTube. But uh, Ginger Tom, this is in fact banned, at least in this part of the continent of America. So it's kind of an accurate title. But... We got some sirens going on in the background. Interesting. We had, I actually had a shooting on this street uh, this morning or yesterday night or something like that. Uh, a little, quite a ways away from me, so I wasn't in any, any damage, but uh, kind of an interesting because this is usually a pretty quiet neighborhood, so uh, that is an interesting thing. But that being said, what else is going on in the world right now? at this point or over the past little while and one of the things is this a set of articles i found on the nuclear secrecy blog restricted data the nuclear secrecy blog by alex wellerstein if i'm pronouncing that right and uh, it has a little blurb on wellerstein here quote wellerstein is a historian of science and nuclear weapons and a professor at the stevens institute of technology he's also the creator of nuke map which is a pretty cool tool i'm going to link to this uh, nuke map in where this video is posted because everyone, if you've never played with it, take like 30 seconds to a minute out of your life to just like see how it works. Because what Nuke Map is, is it's a tool to simulate and to get a map using, originally it was Google Maps, now it's using Leaf and uh, OpenStreetMap, the simulated effect of what would happen if a nuclear weapon went off in your city and how big the blast radius would be. And would you be in the blast radius versus all sorts of other terrible things that would happen to you in the event of a nuclear attack on your particular city or nearby. And so you can like plug in various types of bombs, etc. with the, of course, obvious effect that they're all bad news. And you can even see that, for example, North Korea with the missiles that they have can actually hit Saskatoon and they can destroy Saskatoon with the weapons that they have. Isn't that wonderful? But that's not actually why I'm reading from his blog today. Uh, He's got a series of four separate articles. 
And each one kind of builds on the last one a little bit. So I'm only going to go into the first article because it really gets the point through, I think, all four. The other four are more just sort of like, uh, if you don't fully accept what I'm going to say from his blog on the first part, then you may want to read the second and third parts and fourth parts uh, to kind of get deeper or closer picture to it. But the context for the, the first article was it was right around the time of the US, the last US election. And there was a lot of people who were worried, who were Democrats, that uh, Donald Trump would start a nuclear war with Russia or China or whatever. And then on the right, there was a lot of people worried that Hillary Clinton would start a nuclear war <laughs> with Russia. And so there became this kind of discussion of, well, how exactly does a nuclear war happen? And what is keeping us from destroying ourselves as a species using this massive amount of weaponry we've built up on both sides of the former Iron Curtain in the United States and in Russia? And so some people have been saying, oh, there must be something some military personnel or some individual who gets to have the final say so that if, for example, the U.S. president uh, just up and decides to have a bad day, or maybe he's fooling around on Twitter and he reads some fake news and he thinks that the United States is under attack, uh, surely someone will notice something is going wrong and will stop him from pushing the red button. And this idea that there are safeguards in place to prevent this sort of thing. And I'm just going to let him, in his words, kind of deal with this. Uh, so this is his article, The President and the Bomb. Quote, I'm in the process of writing up something more substantial about nuclear weapons in the 2016 presidential election. But I keep getting asked one thing repeatedly, both in person, over email and online. Quote, are there any checks in place to keep the U.S. president from starting a nuclear war? Quote, what's amazing about this question really is how seriously it misunderstands the logic of the U.S. command and control system. It gets it exactly backwards. And then it has a little picture here of, quote, U.S. Air Force on Twitter, always on the ready is an understatement when you are providing the president of the United States with the ability to launch ICBMs. And then it has a link. Quote, a recent tweet from the United States Air Force expresses U.S. nuclear doctrine in a nutshell. Always on the ready is an understatement. So, and then it thanks uh, Alexandra Levy of the Atomic Heritage Foundation for the link. And then continues on. Quote, the entire point of the U.S. command and control system is to guarantee that the president and only the president is capable of authorizing nuclear war whenever he needs to. It is about enabling the president's power not checking or restricting him. As former Vice President Dick Cheney put it in 2008, the President of the United States is now for 50 years is followed at all times, 24 hours a day, by a military aide carrying a football that contains the nuclear codes that he would use and be authorized to use in the event of a nuclear attack on the United States. Pause. And and conventional attacks, both on the United States and on certain parts of their international apparatus. That may have been after the fact of when Dick Cheney in particular said this. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. But in the Bush years, there were changes to the US doctrine of when and how they would use nuclear weapons, that they are a first strike country. They are a country that does not wait to be attacked by nuclear weapons or even the, the possibility of nuclear weapons, merely an attack of some kind will trigger the doomsday machinery in the United States specifically. So continuing on, he could launch the kind of devastating attack that the world has never seen. He doesn't have to check with anybody. He doesn't have to call Congress. He doesn't have to check with the courts. This isn't new. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. This has been discussed since the 1940s. And yet people today seem rather shocked to hear it, even very educated people. Pause. I mean, I've kind of looked into this a little bit before this particular article. And so, I mean, some of it is a little bit surprising, but even still, like, I was shocked uh, that there's nothing, that it's completely set up in this way. Uh, continuing on, quote, to be sure, the official doctrine that I've seen on the nuclear command authority implies that the president should be given as much advice as possible from the military, the Department of Defense, and so on. But nothing I've seen suggests that this is any more than advisory. And the entire system is set up so that once the president's order is verified and authenticated, there are meant to be only minutes until launch. It isn't entirely intuitive. Why the president and not someone else or some combination of people? Why not have some kind of two-man rule whereby two top political figures were required to sign off 
on the use of it before it happened. The two-man rule is required for commanders to authorize nuclear launches, so why not the commander-in-chief? To understand why this is, you have to go back and look into the history of how this doctrine came about. Today we tend to discuss in terms of the speed in which a retaliation would be necessary in the event of a crisis. But the debate wasn't originally about expediency at all, but about an understanding of the constitutional power and the inherently political nature of the bomb. I see the debate about the untargeting of Kyoto, pause, and basically goes into the fact that Kyoto was one of the cities in Japan that was originally slated to be destroyed by nuclear weapons. And they kind of go into the details of that, continuing on. Quote, in mid-1945, it's the first place where some of these questions start to get worked out. Presidents generally do not pick targets in war. That's a general's job. Like all things in history, there are, or have, of course, been exceptions. But when it came to the atomic bomb, the civilian branch of the executive government personified here by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, shows a picture, demanded veto power over the targets. The military, here General Leslie Groves, again in the picture, pushed back, asserting that this was a military matter. Stimson insisted and eventually got the president's personal ear in the matter, and that was that. Truman, for his part, while he did not authorize the actual bombing in any explicit way, he was shown the bombing order, but he did not issue it, nor was his approval required, though he could have vetoed it, did, on August 10th, reassert nuclear authority by prohibiting future bombing activity without his explicit permission. From that point forward, the president made very explicit that his office was in charge of the atomic bomb and its uses, not the military. It was not a military weapon, which is to say, it was an inherently political weapon, one that needed to be handled by that most inherently political office, the presidency. This became the framework for talking about domestic control over nuclear weapons in the 1940s, the civilian versus military split. It was believed that only an elected civilian could make the call for this of all weapons. Truman himself put it to uh, David Lilenthal in 1948, quote, I don't think we ought to use this thing unless we absolutely have to. It's a terrible thing to order the use of something like that, that is so terribly destructive, destructive beyond anything we have ever had. You've got to understand that this isn't a military weapon. It is used to wipe out women and children and unarmed people and not for military uses. So we've got to treat this thing differently from rifles and cannons and ordinary things like that. In the early days, this civilian military split was actually enforced at the physical level, with the non-nuclear parts of the weapons kept by the military and the nuclear parts in the pits kept by the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission. By the end of the Eisenhower administration, changes in doctrine, technology, sealed pit weapons, and fears, e.g. a Soviet sneak attack, had led to 90% of the nuclear weapons transferred into the hands of the military, making the civilian military distinction a somewhat theoretical one. Eisenhower also pre-designated the authority to start nuclear war to several military commanders on the front lines on the idea that they would not have time to call back to Washington and should Soviet tanks start pouring into Western Europe. Pause. So this is basically an example here that the United States didn't have to be attacked. It was enough that Western Europe be attacked, and not by nuclear forces, just by tanks. I mean, that would be pretty bad, but again, we're talking about destroying the entire human race at this point, or at least getting close to it, and certainly destroying much of Europe, probably semi-permanent. Continuing on, quote, so the, while the president is the only person who can authorize a nuclear attack, he can also extend the, that authority to others if he deems it necessary. The Kennedy administration, looking to assort more positive control over the beginning of a nuclear conflict, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Pause. So I just read a book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and there was something also relevant to this that kind of came up in that book, which is that going to the president can choose to engage the situation versus actually control what happens on the ground, that actually came up in the Cuban Missile Crisis because Kennedy wanted to have a blockade of Cuba. And a blockade turns out to mean something very specific in the US naval codes. The rules that the Navy itself has accumulated over not just the history of the United States, but probably going all the way back in British history in terms of how exactly a Navy works. And if you set up a blockade and a ship crosses the blockade, what exactly do you do to that ship if they do not answer your call or turn around? And it turns out that this is a really difficult and a thing that the US president either doesn't have the authority over or just can't fix in the course of time that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you had this Navy that was basically told by the executive branch of the United States, you must block all these ships going through your, your lanes, but let the submarines go through. If there are submarines, just kind of let them through or like try to get in their way, but like don't start shooting yet. We, we are just trying to have a show of force 
and make sure that it looks like you're there, it looks like you're, you're doing something, but if they send U-boats under you, just kind of deal with it. And the Navy basically pushed back saying, no, actually, uh, that's, that's not how our rules work. Uh, our rules of engagement are so-and-so, and you as the executive branch can't change that. That's actually up to the military to, to deal with what happens in the actual open water. <laughs> like, uh, you do the talking, we do the implementation of those, your ideas, but we're not letting submarines pass. And this or was very close to leading to nuclear war, because had the Soviets put a submarine under the, the blockade, the Navy would have shot it and started the end of the world, it, or at least a, a massive and major uh, nuclear strike on both the United States and Russia and the American allies. So that would have included here in Canada. And so kind of going back to this article here, quote, so especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which raised the real possibility of a low level of misunderstanding escalating in terms of uncertainty, requiring the weapons themselves to have sophisticated electronic controls, permissive action links, that would prevent anyone without a coded authorization to use them. There are more to these stories, but I just want to illustrate a bit what, of what contr the control debate was really about. Making sure the president, and only the president, was ultimately the one making decisions about the bomb. And I've also often been asked, would the officer carrying the football actually go forward with a nuclear attack, especially if it seems uh, heedless or uncalled for? The nuclear football is the special computer that once the nuclear codes are inputted into it, somehow electronically starts the sequence of events that leads to the weapons being used. Uh, which I find lovingly op optimistic. The entire job of the person carrying the football is to enable the president to launch the attack. They would not presume to know the big picture of why the president was doing it. They are not a high level military or policy maker. They are only going to do their job. That is what they are chosen to do. Would the military second guess the president and override the order? I mean, anything is possible. This has just never happened before, so who knows? But I am dubious. In 1973, Major Harold Herring was fired for asking, quote, how can I know that an order I received to launch my missiles came from a sane president? Pause. I'm just going to refer to the, I think it's the century itself, in terms of Adam Curtis's very well put description of how the kinds of thinking that would lead to that kind of question being asked got more and more political power as time went by, uh, up until uh, actually a little bit before 73. But that kind of question was bound to be asked at some point. And I mean, we're talking quite a while before our current situation. But anyway, continuing here. Quote, not because it is a fireable offense to imply that the president might not at all times be entirely capable capable of making such an order, but because to start to question that order would mean to put the entire credibility of nuclear deterrent at risk. The entire logic of the system is that the president's will uh, on this point must be authoritative. If people start second guessing orders, the entire strategic artifice breaks down. So is there any check on the president's power to use nuclear weapons? Well, technically the US election process is meant to be that check. Highlight, let's say that again, quote, the U.S. election process is meant to be that check. Don't elect people you don't trust with unilateral authority to launch nuclear weapons, period. And this indeed has been a theme in numerous U.S. elections, including the most recent one. It is one issue among many, of course. And then it goes into the kind of taboo about nuclear weapons and the the worries the author personally has in terms of whether or not, for example, uh, it, I think he talks about it in one of his later articles here, but apparently Richard Nixon would fly into these drunken or maybe even drug-fueled rages and even brag that he could end the walk out of the room and end the world as sort of like a, Haha, I could do it, want me to do it sort of thing. And so it's not that our current situation has been the only president who has been a little unhinged. Certainly Reagan had his days too. But it is worth pointing out that the way that the nuclear system in the United States is set up is not set up with checks and balances in mind, like virtually all other aspects of US policy. It is entirely in the hands of the president. Our lives are in the hands of the president and only the president. And the again, the other couple of articles kind of go a little bit more into depth of this, but just the point here that we are still alive entirely because that button has not been pushed and those codes have not been entered. And every day that goes by that we have a president that we can't fully trust to not just do this. Again, it's a very risky situation for us all to be in and something to be uh, worth thinking about 
in any case. But that has been a little bit of a stable uh, issue, a stable situation, even for the past four years, as unstable as the current president of the United States is. And as who knows, maybe that's going to change in the next little while. We are in an election year here, uh, but a little bit closer to home. There have been over the past couple of weeks, I think I mentioned them in the last video, a series of blockades of rail and major thoroughfare streets from the First Nations communities all across and around the country to protest what's going on in wet sweat and lands which as far as i know as of this recording is still happening there is dialogue taking place and there is progress being made at a resolution but while that progress is being made and while the economy is still kind of ground to a halt the premiers specifically the alberta premier jason kenney who is definitely a familiar name from the harbor government has a tactic to reply to these blockades in law so this is from aptn which is actually probably one of the better news sources in canada quote alberta premier jason kenney's united conservative party announced a new bill in tuesday's firm speech that is designated to put a stop to what he calls quote illegal blockades pause so it's always a bad sign when they start putting laws to make things that are already illegal even more illegal as if the first set of laws they were breaking weren't somehow effective enough like it's not that they increased the penalty of these laws it's not that they decided to enforce these laws it's that they throw an entire another layer of laws on top of the original laws that weren't being followed to to do what exactly perhaps to encourage people not to break those laws but regardless quote kenny told reporters gathered at the alberta legislature that blockades across canada and alberta have hurt economies of every province which is kind of the point i mean sometimes peaceful nonviolent protest does get in the way of people making money right that there is profits that are not being made by big corporations across canada over the past a couple of weeks and there is a good reason for that, right? Uh, the wet sweat and still have are getting a rough deal by the federal government and the RCMP and the BC provincial government, and they have not worked out that in a peaceful way yet. So, quote, continuing on, I have spoken to major player investors who have withdrawn or canceled multi-billion dollar projected investments in Canada, in part because of the an appearance of a inability for Canada to govern itself along our critical infrastructure in particular. Pause. Now, note they said Canada to govern itself. Uh, this is kind of a key point here because it's kind of assuming here that Canada is governing the First Nations land, that especially the unceded land, as part of itself. So it's like Canada is not being sufficiently colonialist in making and asserting its dominance over uh, areas that are not part of Canada, therefore, we're not going to invest in uh, this, these areas. Well, great. Perhaps you should go to the First Nations and get their permission before you put pipelines through their lines or land, perhaps. Uh, anyway, continuing on. Kenny didn't name any of the investors he spoke with, which means he could have made them up, but who knows. Uh, he said the blockading of what he calls critical infrastructure is illegal and needs to stop. This is not legitimate and lawful protest. Albertans and Canadians respect our constitutionally protected freedom of expression, of assembly, and to protest, but blocking railways, roadways, commuter trains, and critical infrastructure is simply and plainly illegal. Pause. In other words, don't protest anywhere important. Stay in your free speech zones, and you can have your legal protest because you won't bother anyone. You'll be out of sight, out of mind, and don't do anything to rock the boat. Good God, that would be terrible. So continuing on, Kenny says the government will be intro introducing a bill to prevent blockades in the province. Pause. As if C-51 wasn't good enough for this purpose anyway. That already all of the protesters who have taken part in this can be arrested at, long after the fact and disappeared and fall into the dark hole that I've described in previous episodes with all of the powers that the federal government has to do this and to surveil on everyone involved. Still not enough. They need to add more. They have to do something specific to Alberta. Quote, that is why today the government of Alberta has introduced in the legislature bill number one, the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, which imposes or stiff new penalties on lawbreakers who purposefully block critical essential infrastructure, such as railways, roadways, telecommunication lines, telecommunication lines, 
uh, utilities, oil and gas production and refinery sites, pipelines and related and related infrastructure. So that could be the donut shop at the the pipeline or somewhere in Fort Mac, maybe a Tim Hortons. Maybe it could be, yeah, it could be a lot of things like donut shops would probably fall into that if the Saskatchewan Essential Services legislation is any indication. Quote, Kenny said penalties will include daily fines for individuals of up to $10,000 a day or a six month prison sentence or both with each day of protest, a new charge and fine. So I'm just kind of thinking back to watching the Eyes on the Prize, which is again, a documentary about the civil rights struggle in the United States, uh, where there were people who broke the law and who did peacefully protest and kind of get in the way in things like Southern diners, uh, the equivalent of a donut shop. Um, and th they kind of made themselves a little bit annoying, I'm sure, to the people in their communities, but they did get their point across. That is to say that they eventually did win the, a good deal of advances in civil rights uh, across the United States. But had they faced up to six months in prison and $10,000 fines per day, uh, it would have been a little bit more difficult to find people who are will, would be willing to, to protest like that. And, and the same will be true here. I went to the barricades. I was a little worried for, for a lot of reasons, but $10,000 a day fine was not one of my worries, thankfully. But even though we weren't blocking the rail lines, this is the sort of thing that it's a he said, she said between you and the police on this. So even if you did something like that, where you weren't technically blocking anything, you ju just were sort of there, maybe you were there as a journalist or covering the event, those sorts of details kind of get smudged and brushed aside in cases where Again, $10,000 a day gets added to your bill very quickly. So, quote, it will also be an offense to aid, counsel, or direct the commission of an offense, such as a blockade or a protest on critical infrastructure, i.e. if you give advice to people in Alberta who then go out and do a blockade or then go out and protest in the street and walk around in the street. Again, that's in streets are now critical infrastructure, right? Then suddenly you are going to be guilty of this $10,000 a day fine as well as serious jail time. And good luck, by the way, being in jail in Alberta if you protested against a pipeline. I'm sure that there's a lot of people in jail who may not look kindly on you for being anti-pipeline and anti-oil in the Alberta prison system. That might not be a very safe place to be in that case, but who knows? Quote, supporters of the wet sweat and set up a blockade on CN Rail Line on the edge of Edmonton last week. Quote, and police from coast to coast are dealing with or have dealt with a number of protests and blockades. And then they kind of talk a little bit more about what's going on, how many people are arrested. And quote, Alberta's Justice Minister Doug Schweitzer wants similar legislation enacted across the country. Now, I haven't heard of the Saskatchewan government doing this sort of thing, but they have the authority to do so as a majority government. And with their hard on for oil and protecting big oil, they have every incentive to follow Alberta in doing this. And so, quote, we are calling, make sure they are vocal in their displeasure with these types of protests. And hopefully they enact similar legislation from coast to coast. Again, that was from the APTN's Chris Stewart, a very timely, although now a couple of weeks delayed article. I find this interesting because it's, it's not just about these particular blockades. It's not this uh, First Nations issue that is being at stake here. It is the expanse of political power by the government in Canada to restrict the right to protest, to restrict the right to peacefully protest, and the, to restrict the right to gather on public roadways and to march with people who agree with you that something has to change. And maybe you don't agree right now that something has to change. Maybe you don't agree that we need a, a radical change in the way that the political structure of this country works. Maybe you don't agree that a Western Canada could make it on their own, but it should be possible to imagine that the federal government goes just that little bit too far and that they, for example, implement a national energy program. That would actually be very, very terrible for Alberta. And people would be very, very angry in Alberta. And they may be tempted to go out into the street and start voicing their anger in a peaceful way by en masse taking to the streets. But that would be the trap they would fall into. Because once they started doing that, each person who goes into the streets, again, can be charged with six months of jail time per day of being out in the street and $10,000 a day of fines. So this is something that could very well bite the conservatives in the ass. That's the conservatives. Never mind the people with unpopular in Alberta ideas that they may want to take 
again, peacefully into the street. So that's a, kind of an important thing to keep an eye on. I did not get a chance to read this particular bill, but that it, the fact that they're talking along these lines is very troubling. And making policy in response to a blockade like this in an emotionally charged situation as this is, is pretty much guaranteed to be making bad law and law that has consequences that the people involved are not thinking about. Again, the National Energy Project, that would be one such consequence. Having conservatives arrested en masse, that would be one example consequence that they are not thinking of right now. But this would be a consequence of this bill. So that's one of the things that's going on. Another thing that was going on this week is, well, actually, actually this goes a little bit further back. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Cloudflare. I keep promising to do so later. And I will. I, I'm going to get there. But I'm, I don't really want to get into it too much today other than the fact that I was asked by Richard Stallman uh, the Richard Stallman to write a, an article about it for him. And so I wrote an article. It was maybe about a thousand words or 1200 words or something like that. And I was not finished this article. I put it on the public web so that other people could help me and edit it and basically hopefully do most of the work involved in fact checking things that I was saying and that my words would go out to the world and that people would hear them and then that would inspire others to chip in and then maybe between the, the, the whole of the world who's a uh, interested in this particular topic, then everyone combined could make something worth uh, worthy of Richard Stallman's time and a request. And so I put this out there into the world. And then I kind of ran out of time and kind of sat on my back burner for a while. Sorry, Richard Stallman, I'm still working on it. But someone took this and they published it as a book. Now, it wasn't like they took it, edited it, and then like made it perfect and then published it as a book. No, they, they took it whole stock with my notes inside it of what I wanted to do with it and just like published it as an ebook. And I think maybe even a physical book as well, although I haven't confirmed that one. But it was like sent to a publisher and the publisher for a while approved it. And so this book was in the wild, The Great Cloud Wall, quote unquote, by Jeff Cliff, by this official publisher, thing somewhere in Germany. And then after a couple of days, the publisher removed this book from their catalog and sent a message to the person who did this along the lines of this book is under copyright and it has a license already therefore we can't publish it so first of all somebody took this article and made a book and made a published author out of me at least some kind of published author then two the book got removed and censored because of copyright nonsense uh, and then three the icing on the cake is the license in question that this article was actually licensed for was the WTFPL. I won't actually go into what that means, but long story short, that license means that anyone can take that particular article and do whatever they want with it. They can copyright it and then restrict others from it. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is that it gets out there and that I have my copy etc. And so the book publisher had the right to publish it. It was in the license itself. They had to read about 10 words to get the full picture of what the license meant. You didn't need to be a copyright lawyer to understand just how utterly permissive this license was. And nevertheless, they refused to publish it. So that was my little adventure over the past uh, two weeks in becoming a published author and then being unpublished and uh, censored due to copyright issues. Surprise, surprise. But it, at least I can kind of tell that story and have my name as a... Yes, there was once a, an article written by me, but please don't read it. It's really not finished yet. I really should finish it before people actually read it. So there's that. Yeah, I'm famous. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to, to do a little bit more than publish a book to be famous. But I think that the if you watch TV, especially in like talk shows and stuff like that, you'll find that a lot of the people they have are trying to sell a book. And if you kind of look into why they feel confident enough to talk about a particular topic, it's because they've written a book about it. So in this case, I'm not quite at the point where I'm confident enough to write a book about the Great Cloud Wall, but certainly there's enough material to do so on that in this project of mine. So who knows, maybe that actually will happen someday. But anyway, another thing that's been going on this week in my world is I've been reading this book and, uh, well, I actually have it right here. I might as well show it for the video viewers, uh, the live viewers. This is one Graham Clark's World Prehistory, a new outline. It's a little bit of a dated book. So perhaps some of the conclusions and uh, perhaps everything in it has been overturned by newer findings in archaeology and anthropology and that sort of thing. But one of the things that came out of this is, and the person who just joined may, may be interested specifically in this, is the end of the last ice age. There's a, a section of the book that talks about it. 
and the impact of the early human civilization who were on the edge of the glaciers and who were in the northern tundras and who were in the far north of the what was possible to survive in and they survive and they survive fairly well and they were fairly effective at it as far as we can tell or at least as far as they could tell in the 60s by specifically targeting certain species of wild game and so this may have been although probably wasn't the the buffalo uh, the buffalo would have been a little bit further south than this but certainly reindeer perhaps caribou and things like reindeer way way up north there were people that tracked them, and they followed them around, and they made a good living and had their families raised and went from area to area following these wild animals, hunting them, and became very specialized at doing so. And one of the impacts of climate change way back then, when the Ice Age first ended, is these herds started to no longer be as present. And the wild nuts and berries or whatever the vegetation that they uh, would know to eat and they knew was safe to eat was no longer as available. And even though the end of the ice age meant that there was more area available for human beings to exist in and the temperature being warmer, you didn't have to struggle as hard to do things like have an agricultural civilization. This was before agriculture really had gotten its start. And so you had these Northern groups that were suddenly under a lot of pressure because you had, they had specialized so much and their entire culture was wrapped around the hunting of this particular types of game, whether it be big game, like perhaps mammoths or something like it. I, again, I don't remember the specific details on that side, but they over specialized a little bit given the climate change that they were about to hit. And so for the first couple of generations, they would have had trouble and their population would have decreased. They would have possibly mass starvation could easily have been one of the side effects they encountered. And the, the society that they had or elephants, I think elephants are a little bit further south. I don't think that the elephants were that far north, but again, elephant, mammoth, again, big game. Think very specific creatures that these early humans were targeting and their food supply was no longer there. And so they had this huge amount of stress that they had to learn to cope with and learn to deal with and learn to live in different ways. And for the first couple of generations, they struggled, they had trouble, but after a couple of generations, they figured a new way to live. And some of these cultures either went extinct or got subsumed in other uh, surrounding cultures uh, or the people involved went and basically did different things, learned to fish, that sort of thing. But the point here is that that was the key, the, the sort of collapse and the breaking of the old order uh, for advancement in human civilization. The cultures that failed when the Ice Age no longer allowed them to have a, a stable food supply became better at learning and better at transmitting their knowledge, either amongst themselves or with other groups or however they did it. The point here is that it was the darkest days for humanity for a while, or at least that significant portion of humanity, that led to the potential to be realized of a warmer world, of an easier life, of a more stable life with agriculture. And I could go more into how I, agriculture and uh, civilized life was not the ideal situation, perhaps compared to the lives that they, their specialized lives, hunting uh, reindeer, etc. But it was the facing of this adversity. It was the facing of this period of time where everything was broken. Their cultures broke down, their food supply broke down. Everything seemed like it was going wrong. It probably seemed to them like the end of the world or something close to it. But they had to go through that to get to the next step. They had to go through this period where they were learning and learning how to learn and learning how to adapt to get to the point where they could learn to adapt to this wider range so that they could learn to settle, to start paying more attention perhaps to the how seeds worked, that sort of thing. And that led to art, led to better architecture, better tools, and everything we've seen since in the development of civilization across Europe and elsewhere. And so I kind of look at this now that we are facing our great challenge, not just of this generation, but of a series of many generations, that we are going to face a situation where the way we take for granted is the only way to live, the way that we take for granted how good things are right now may be taken away from us as the climate shifts. But this has happened before. And even though in this case, it is a little bit unprecedented as far as how much it's happening, we shouldn't lose hope because it may very well be that what we're going through right now is the key 
to getting us willing to adapt, able to adapt and more used to adapting. And maybe that's what's actually needed for the next step of human, not evolution, but civilization. Something to hope for anyway. Which is kind of what, one of the last things I wanted to bring up today. Which is, I kind of talked about why I'm doing this in my first episode, but it's been a whole year now, so I kind of want to remind the people listening here that sometimes it does seem dark, and it seems like things are not going well. And it seems that in your life, perhaps things are out of control, perhaps you don't feel that you're going anywhere, and maybe the people around you, you've either lost touch with them, or maybe you've the only people you talk to in a, a day are the ones that you're buying and selling from. Maybe you shop on Amazon, so maybe you don't even have that. That even though there are people in the world around you, you're not really connected with them. And sometimes it seems that maybe nothing that you do in your life matters or that things are that you try, everything kind of goes wrong. Maybe you're young, still in school. Maybe you haven't reached that point in your life yet where you're comfortable with your place in the world. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in life. And sometimes life throws really difficult things at you and you have to kind of cope with them. But as long as you're listening to this, as long as you have the ability to listen, to leave comments where these videos are posted, to tell me what's happening in your life, which by the way, feel free to get in touch, jeffrey.cliff at gmail.com. As long as we're all here together anyway, maybe we can work together a little bit. Maybe we can talk about what's going wrong in our lives, what's frustrating to us, and what's meaningful in our lives, and what's going well. We can get a conversation going. We can keep talking. And I hope that someone who's listening to these shows, that they do reach someone who's having a rough time, and that it gives you something to listen to, even just for a little bit. And if you turn over, you, you give up for the day, that's fine, but tomorrow we'll still be here, and maybe together we can get back up and keep going. So that's why I'm doing this. And I hope those of you who are listening kind of take that into mind as, as I continue. And I, I sometimes do talk about really dark things, in, like nuclear war, for example. But let's see now that they're all on the table what we can do about it, okay? So that being all said, if you've enjoyed this broadcast and want to see more of it, please consider going to subscriberstar.com slash jeff-cliff, maybe dropping something in there. And as usual, if you have any Creative Commons music, I do have an MP3 player now, uh, so I can listen to it during the week. I have been slowly going through media. Unfortunately, I don't have anything today. The time has kind of run out a little bit, but I will play it if you send it to me. And if you have anything that you'd like me to talk about, again, send me a line and we'll see what we can do. And with that, I'm gonna switch to the goodbye song and switch the background music off. Hopefully you enjoy. See you next week. We'll see you tomorrow, but in the meanwhile, always remember to be good and so... Goodbye now. 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 Goodbye now.